My dear friends in Christ, I would like this morning to speak to you about three topics, briefly on three different topics, Mission Sunday, St. Luke, and also the Holy Rosary. So today is actually Mission Sunday, and it's not something that has been uh, greatly promoted in this country, but I'll read from the Recolta, the indulgences, the faithful who on the second last Sunday of October uh, take part in one of the sacred functions usually celebrated for the missions and offer their devout prayers for the conversion of pagans may gain an indulgence of seven years. Those, moreover, who make their confession, receive Holy Communion, and pray as above may gain a plenary indulgence. So we will recite uh, a couple of prayers from the Recolta after Mass for missions. But the purpose of this Sunday, or, or having a Sunday designated as Mission Sunday, was to arouse in the faithful the apostolic spirit of wanting to bring about the conversion of all of those who are outside the true church. In the United States, early on, we were referred to as a mission country, and the uh, legal um, ranking, I guess, of the dioceses, etc., was under the propagation of the faith in Rome because early on the United States was indeed a mission country. And many of our priests and bishops in the early days of our country came from Europe. And it wasn't until after a while that a seminary was started and native-born Americans, second or third or fourth generation uh you know, Europeans that came to this country and had children, etc., that Americans went to the seminary, were ordained, etc. And because of that, because we have received so many uh, priests from Europe, from other countries, there were two priests in the United States in the early 1900s that thought we should have an American foreign mission society so that we start sending priests to other countries. And uh, it was called, they founded what was called the American Foreign Mission Society, more commonly referred to as Mary Knoll or the Mary Knoll Fathers. And so we had a number of American missionaries who went to China, for example, and were martyred for the faith. Others went to South America or other countries. I remember when I was in Catholic grade school, we had this little, each of the students had this little cardboard box during Lent. And we would put our pennies and nickels and dimes in there for the missions. And there was always that thrust to pray for and to sacrifice for the missions, bringing the light of the gospel to other lands. Well, now we find our own land, our own country, you might say reverting to paganism, reverting to uh, an anti-Christian or non-Christian attitude insofar as morals and way of thinking. So we should have a great desire to spread the faith when we, when an opportunity presents itself, not to hesitate to lead others to the truth. We say that the Catholic Church has four marks, one holy Catholic and apostolic. And that fourth mark, apostolic, means that it was founded on the apostles, that's the first bishops, and there is what we call apostolic succession, but there also is the apostolic spirit. So our Lord said to the apostles, go forth and teach all nations. Spread the gospel to every land. And we still have that same apostolic spirit. We pray for and desire the spread of the faith, the increase of Holy Mother Church, so let us make that a daily intention in our prayers. And again, that is the idea behind Mission Sunday, to remind the faithful that we all should be apostolic in our attitude, in our desire to spread the faith, our prayers for the conversion of non-Catholics, whether they be Protestants or uh, you know, pagans, infidels, uh, members of other denominations, other churches, etc., to bring all men to the true faith. Second topic I wanted to speak about is St. Luke. 
Now, as I announced before Mass, the Mass today is St. Luke, which takes precedence over the Sunday. It is has what we call the liturgical rank of, of a double of the second class. And that is because St. Luke was an evangelist. We owe to him one of the four Gospels. And it is a unique Gospel in many ways. St. Luke may have been one of the 72 disciples that our Lord sent out before him into the cities he was about to go. Some believe that he was one of those disciples, in which case he would have known and met our Lord. But others believe that he never met our Lord and that he became a Christian early on after the spread of the gospel. He was from Antioch, we know that, and he was a doctor, a physician. St. Paul refers to, as my dear, refers to him as my dear physician in his epistle to the Colossians, I believe. So St. Luke joined himself to St. Paul and traveled with St. Paul and thereby was able to give us not only his gospel, but another wonderful book in the New Testament called the Acts of the Apostles. Much of it deals with St. Paul's missionary journeys, but also the early church, the coming of the Holy Ghost at Pentecost, the conversion of St. Paul, the imprisonment of St. Peter, and those, those early events in the early church. So we owe a great deal to him, but especially his gospel. St. Luke is the only one that gives us the story of the nativity of our Lord, the Christmas story. And in fact, all five of the joyful mysteries, we have those stories because of St. Luke. The Annunciation, the visitation of Our Lady to her cousin Elizabeth, the birth of our Lord, his presentation to te to in the temple 40 days after his birth and the prophecy of Simeon, and then the finding of our Lord in the temple at the age of 12. All five of those joyful mysteries are found only in the Gospel of St. Luke. It is true that St. Matthew mentions the adoration of the Magi and also tells us about the revelation to St. Joseph by an angel of the miraculous conception of Our Lady and, and our Divine Lord's origin was revealed to him by an angel. But other than that, no evangelist mentioned anything about the infancy and the youth of our Lord. So we owe a great deal to St. Luke. His gospel also gives us a number of parables that are only found in his gospel. The parable of the Good Samaritan, the prodigal son, the rich man and Lazarus, and so forth. So it is a wonderful gospel giving us these beautiful parables, these beautiful stories. St. Luke is the only gospel that gives us the three canticles of the New Testament, the Magnificat of Our Lady at the Annunciation, the Benedictus of Zachary, and the Nunc Dimittis of Simeon in the temple. One might ask, how did St. Luke know about the Annunciation and the Visitation and the Nativity of Our Lord? He was not there. How did he know these things? Well, St. Luke was very devoted to Our Lady. When he had opportunity to go and visit Our Blessed Mother, he asked her about, these, about Our Lord to tell him about his youth, his infancy, and so forth. And so we have it from Our Lady to St. Luke, and then St. Luke making it known to us. So we owe a great deal to him for what he provided by his pen. St. Luke is one of the four evangelists who were uh, typified to Ezekiel the prophet in the Old Testament under the guise of the four living creatures. They were like angels with wings that would fly about. One had the face of a man, that would be St. Matthew. One had the face of a lion, St. Mark. The face of the ox, was a, is considered a symbol of St. Luke, and the face of an eagle, St. John the Evangelist. And in fact, these same four living creatures are mentioned by St. John in the Apocalypse as flying about the throne of God. So the four Gospels we treat with the greatest reverence. You notice when the Gospel is recited at Mass, everyone stands. 
because the gospel has a greater dignity than the rest of sacred scripture. All of it is the word of God. But the gospel is the story of our Lord himself, his life, his words. And so we owe a great deal again to St. Luke for recording these parables and these words and these stories, especially about our Lord's infancy, the wonderful Christmas story and so forth. And St. Luke can maybe help us to have a great love for Our Lady because he loved Our Lady and it was through her that he learned these stories. And finally, this morning, I would like to speak about the rosary because October is the month of the Holy Rosary. We had that feast day early on, on October 7th, the Feast of the Holy Rosary, which is the anniversary of the great victory at the Battle of Lepanto in 1571, 1570 or 1571. So the Holy Rosary was given by our Blessed Mother to St. Dominic. And St. Dominic began to promote the rosary and found that more heretics were converted by just promoting the rosary and getting the people to pray the rosary than by his preaching and trying to explain the errors of the heresies. And then we find many stories and many great preachers of the rosary. There's a wonderful book by St. Louis Marie de Montfort called The Secret of the Rosary. And he tells a number of stories about another Dominican named Blessed Alan de la Roche, who lived in France in, I think, the 1400s and promoted the rosary. And he tells many different stories in there and explains about the prayers of the rosary, etc. Then we come to our own times, and we find that when Our Lady appeared at Fatima six times, every time she appeared... She told the children to pray the rosary, pray the rosary every day. We should look upon that as traditional Catholics in this age. We should look upon it as a must to pray the rosary every day, to never omit the rosary because we need so much those graces from our Blessed Mother. And I wish I had it before me to read to you, but there's a wonderful quote from Sister Lucia the oldest of the three children who went on to become a religious, first a Dorothean sister and then transferred to the Carmelite order. But in 1957, the priest who was the promoter of the cause for canonization of Francisco and Jacinta had an interview. Now, she lived in a cloistered convent, and so it was almost impossible for someone to be able to meet with her. But this priest was able to do so given his position as promoter of the cause of beatification for Francisco and Jacinta. And in the course of this one interview in December of 1957, she said to him, Father, there is no problem, whether in the individual lives of people, in families, with nations, there is no problem that cannot be solved by the rosary. And she said, that God has given more value, you might say, to the rosary in our times than in the past. The rosary has always been a wonderful prayer, a great means of grace. But she says that God has given to the rosary in our times a greater efficacy than it had in previous centuries because of the times in which we live. And again, Our Lady asked every time that she appeared for the daily recitation, at least five decades a day, of the rosary. And it's very interesting in the Fatima story that Lucia had been asking Our Lady, will you tell us who you are? And she said, yes, in October, I will tell you my name. And so finally the last apparition came in October. And how did she identify herself? She could have called herself the Holy Mother of God, or as to St. Bernadette at Lourdes, the Immaculate Conception, or any other of the numerous titles of Our Lady. But she said, I am the Lady of the Rosary. That was the title that she gave to the children at Fatima, showing us how much she delights in our reciting the Rosary and honoring her under that title. So we especially do so during the month of October. 
And we live at a time when, of course, we have a very consequential election coming up in just a couple of weeks. We've had all of the trials of this past year with the coronavirus epidemic. We have had riots in our streets in big cities and strife and division in this country and how much we need to turn to God and our Blessed Mother in prayer and especially through the Holy Rosary. And when you can, to pray even all 15 decades of the Rosary and do your best to meditate on the mysteries. One common complaint is, well, I find it so hard, my, I get distracted. All right, so do I. And how do we help ourselves to meditate on the mysteries? One means is by using a book that has readings or meditations on the mysteries or a picture of the mystery. But do your best to think about the mysteries as you pray your Our Fathers and Hail Marys of the Rosary. I mentioned that this wonderful book by St. Louis de Montfort called The Secret of the Rosary has a number of stories. And one of them that I recall, a beautiful story, is that there was this monk in a monastery who prayed his rosary every day. Now, this was hundreds of years ago in a monastery where it wasn't part of the schedule. Nowadays, in every religious congregation, order, it's always daily rosary. But back then, in this monastery, it wasn't part of the regular prayer routine. So not all the monks prayed it, but this one monk did every day. And one day, the monks were assembled in the refectory, which is another word for a dining room. They were there for their meal, and that monk was missing. And the abbot sent a monk to go find him, said, go find brother so-and-so. Maybe he didn't hear the bell, whatever. Go see where he is. So he went, and when he came to his cell, he could see a light, a bright light coming out from under the door. And so he peeped through the, the keyhole, looking into the room, and there was this monk praying his rosary, and Our Lady was standing in front of him. So the monk that was sent also saw this vision of Our Lady. And an interesting thing, he said, as the monk that was praying the rosary, as he said the rosary, every time he said a Hail Mary, a rose came out of his mouth and fell at Our Lady's feet. And there was this big pile of roses at the feet of Our Lady. Well, that's why we call it a rosary, because it is a crown of roses that we give to our Blessed Mother when we recite the rosary. So let us remember the power, the efficacy of our of the rosary, and also how Our Lady delights in us praying it, and how she will give us all the graces we need to overcome our faults and sins, to sanctify ourselves, to persevere in this age in which we live, to obtain graces for our loved ones, for conversions. The rosary is so powerful. So let us pray it. Let us pray it devoutly, and may a day never pass on which we fail to pray the Holy Rosary, thus honoring Our Lady, Queen of the Holy Rosary, the Mediatrix of all graces, who will give us all that we need if we honor her as we ought every day. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.